Okay, very important topic. Um, you know, hydratic, simple, clinical discussion. That's what um, I would prefer uh, to do. So around maybe 15, 16 minutes, I'll go through hypercalcemia evaluation. This is the topic given to me, but um, no treatment. I'm not going to get treatment, but if the question comes to the treatment, I'm happy to um, encounter them. A little bit of um, introduction needed definitely um, these days. So I do not have any share in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is not a contract with speaker program. So views expression essentially of mine, but important disclaimer is that I have recently heard a talk in a physical meeting talk um, on hypercalcemia from Deepak Khandalwal. And I really liked and, um, and took some slides um, from him with his permission. So that's my plan. Calcium homeostasis, measurement, hypercalcemia, and the main part I'll tell you a case and how to solve hypercalcemia, how to evaluate. That is, the, that is my portion. And I'll end with the take home points. So calcium homeostasis. So as mineral, most of the calcium is there and the crystals. A very small portion are there in the plasma, whatever they're in the plasma, 45% are ionized form, which is physiologically active form. And I'll be campaigning little bit against ionized form, but remember this is a physiologically active form. 45% bound to protein, mainly albumin. And that's why we do albumin corrected calcium. And 10% complex with anions like citrate, uh, phosphate, sulfur, etc. So there are mainly three organs, the bone, the intestine, the kidney. From the bone, calcium comes in the extracellular fluid, goes back in the same way. From the intestine, mainly absorption. Some amount is going out in the stool. And the kidney one is a very important organ for maintaining calcium homeostasis, which will be coming and going there. So that maintaining a normal calcium level for our body. A quick uh, vitamin D, all this we know very, very clearly. Sunlight in the skin, we have a D, which is, can be D2 or D3 or D2 and D3. That's what D means. In the liver, it will become 25 hydroxy D. In the kidney, the influence of PTH, the activation of the 1 of hydroxylase enzyme will become 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And this will make an active vitamin D binding protein where the calcium will be absorbed. And top bit, the calcium, calcitonin hormone from the thyroid gland, it stimulates the calcium deposit in the bone, reduce the calcium uptake, reduce the calcium, all three organ I was mentioning, that means high calcitonin will give low calcium, whereas high parathyroid hormone will give a bit higher calcium. So basically a balance of three organ, bone, intestine, and kidney, three hormone, vitamin D, PTH, and calcitonin. And here, end of the day, we have the calcium in the blood, which need to be maintained in a correct level, below which there is a problem, above which also there is a problem. How do we measure? Fasting sample is not required, but it is required for the phosphate. And sometimes we can see a falsely high level of serum calcium, and that's the term used as sustained hypercalcemia. At least two samples will document. There can be lab error, there can be sample taken error, there can be sample taken, the drip in the same hand, sample taken in the two nickels. This is one particular uh, sample. Phlebotomy is important that it should be taken without not a lot of squeezing, clinching fist or the two nickel. They be taken ADTA free, vial, washed with diluted hydrochloride. This should be prepared. Things comes now. Tourniquet causes a venastasis, thereby total calcium can go up. And the fist uh, clinching can go up free calcium, that is ionized calcium can go up. Should be in the resting state, that's no doubt. And we should use a white bone needle to avoid the hemolysis. So when you're talking about ionized and total calcium, so ionized calcium, that's the average level, influences the many cellular and the function, tight control, PTH control, measured directly from the calcium specific electrode. Now this is important to remember. This is costly and only some institute will have. Most of the time, if we see an ionized calcium defect, is actually electrode defect. But albumin corrected total calcium, what you do, the basis of the calculation is that initially I mentioned the 50% of the calcium is by the albumin. And this is a simple formula. You can put a lot of points or something. I just made a simple, simple formula because this is what we use in the world. 
4 minus serum albumin into 0.8 plus serum calcium. So albumin is high means your calcium is collect calculated should be normal, but measured all the way low. Albumin low is measured will be low. That is the other way around. What I necessarily wanted to tell you that in clinical practice, ionized calcium is not helpful unless to be otherwise. I have a serious problem in this because of the electrode. A lot of places a wrong electrode or, or expired electrode gives um, a falsely abnormal report of ionized calcium. We no clinical situation is there that we cannot manage or diagnose with an albumin corrected total calcium. But in a few, for example, some people are in ICU and there are a lot of other medications uh, they can they have a severe uh, acid base disturbance one or two other than situation all our clinical practice should be equally done with albumin corrected total calcium which is certainly a lot cheaper than ionized calcium sustained hypercalcemia to avoid the interpretation of the lab error we need at least two sample to document a hypercalcemia that's worth doing it rather than investigating in different causes and then uh, you come back and realize your initial value was a lab error so that's very nice. Roughly, we make the level of 12 and 14, less than 12. No need to panic. Just pull down and see what is happening, what correction can be done. If it is more than 14, important. There can be a cardiac problem, cardiac rhythm disturbance. We need an immediate action. So that's a severe hypercalcemia. In between 12 and 14, we'll tell it's a moderate hypercalcemia. Okay, let's come to the presentation. Now... <clears throat> Causes, if you see before this presentation, there are different ways to classify. I have classified one particular one as a common and uncommon. The commonest, obviously, PTH related. Second common is a malignancy related. So, PTH related, it can be adenoma, hyperplasia, or some other condition like lithium or familial issue. Malignant, uh, malignancy acid hypercalcium is pretty also common. But there are some uncommon causes like a milk alkali syndrome, vitamin A. D toxicity. Now, what is vitamin D? Because of overzealous supplement, we are seeing some cases of vitamin D toxicity with a high calcium level. So I can't tell this very uncommon now. Sarcoidosis, thyrotoxicity, Addison's disease, thyroid, and all this a little bit, um, a little bit uncommon. Symptoms and the signs are pretty non-specific. It's gastrointestinal symptom, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. Constipation, neuromuscular weakness, lethargy, confusion, coma, depending on degree of calcium, genitourinary, polyuria, nocturia, renal poly, cardiovascular syndrome, mainly rhythm disturbance. Signs also very non specific. Dehydration is almost a consistent feature with hypercalcemia and their signs led to the organ system. But don't forget this one. Very old aging, more than 100 years, bone, stone, grown, psychic moves. They can explain everything related to the bone-related problem, kidney stone-related problem, abdominal colic-related problem, and depression and psychic mood. Related. Bones, stones, groans, and psychic moods. It was there in our previous textbook. So otherwise, it can be an acute presentation when they usually present with a neuropsychiatric and a cardiovascular symptom. Acute presentation can be mostly because of malignancy. Very important. But parathyroid crisis can give rise to acute presentation. But one important thing we need to remember, hyperparathyroidism is more of a chronic presentation because over the time, your hyperplasia and adenoma increase in the TSH level, uh, increasing the uh, uh, PTH level. But one thing is very sure, if your calcium level is very, very high, it is likely diagnosis is primary hyperparathyroidism because... Because of malignancy associated hypercalcemia, when your calcium will go to 16-7, primary malignancy will kill you. So if you see somebody at 16-17 um, calcium, is more or less it is a primary hyperparathyroidism that you'll be thinking of. <laughs> now, with this little quick background, let us solve this puzzle. After three days of tiring experience and whole of the day of today working, if you are if you are saying please go with me. Let's let's case, take this case. This is the lady of 71. Her name is Mangalamma, admitted to a hospital in Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. 
<laughs> referred as biochemical screening showed serum calcium of 15.6 mg per deciliter on 40 days after admission. <clears throat> now, why was it done? It's not very clear. They just thrown a biochemistry orthopedic team and uh, that's it. Um, it was like that. So basically, patient was admitted with orthopedician um, with a non-united fracture the infection. The initial fracture happened around 30 days back. So admission, 30 days back, fracture happened, and 40 days after, that is 70 days after the fracture, we are seeing because first time on calcium was done, which should 15.6%. Patient was operated in a different CT in a nursing home because the patient is not improving and non-union, they are referred to bank. Background problem with type 2 diabetes on insulin, fair control, and high blood pressure, not on thiazide. Mm -hmm. So assessment, as I told you, was signs of symptom. She was conscious oriented, BP was normal, sinus rhythm, normal heart rate, systemic examination normal. There is a big open infected wound which was pulled and discharged, which was repeatedly being drained and taken care of. Biochemically, albumin <clears throat> 2.1, normal renal function, hemoglobin is low, urine at one plus ketone, chest x ray, ultrasound, abdomen were normal. Now, <clears throat> treatment-wise, orthopedic team, intravenous antibiotic and re regular dressing, secondary suturing, all have been done in the hospital. For the medical condition, there is a supplement, some, um, there's some protein uh, infusion, and in so diabetes is managed by the modified basal bolus sensor. She was recovering well, but some reason or other, blood calcium was done. <clears throat> And that's how we have been referred. So we rechecked. I told you sustained hypercalcemia. We need to get a recheck done. We have rechecked. It's 15.2. Uh, phosphate was a bit lower side. Alkaline phosphate is 463. Pretty okay. <clears throat> Some reason or other ionized calcium was done. I was campaigning, uh, campaigning actually against ionized calcium. ECG showed some hypercalcemic change. Shortened QT interval. This is the strip of the ECG for this link. So, <clears throat> assessment-wise, when you started seeing, clinically well hydrated, average intake output was like this, 1.1.4 .1 liter, renal function normal, albumin 3.2, that was an admission albumin, now albumin 3.2, serum calcium corrected becomes 16.1. Patient was given an IV fluid as our standard practice of managing hypercalcemia, frosamide and pomidronate. It is a bit few years old. Pomidronate was easily available, and that is our preferred treatment. 30 milligram per day, we have given for five days. So what next? What is the cause of patients? We are treating hypercalcemia, we are treating, but you need to find the cause of hypercalcemia. <clears throat> Very high calcium, as I told, suggestive of hyperparathers. It can be of this condition and, um, and increased bone resorption, red logistic, superior steel. Uh, resorption by now you understand the commonest cause will be PTH induced hypercalcium or hyperparathyroidism. These are the, some pictures. Um, it looks like about the X ray skeletal survey you do, a uh, periosteo, osteo uh, resorption, osteoporosis, juxta articular, and the top resorption. Very nicely seen in this picture. And if you see and bone scan, you can see all those active hot areas. So this is a different patient of primary hyperparathyroidism. Just for the sake of the picture I'm showing, that's an extra picture. And very nicely, juxtaosticular osteoporosis is seen and a tuft lysis. Lysis of the tuft terminal phalanges is, is, is very nicely seen. <coughs> also, the skull X-ray. In our time, we used to do all skeletal X-ray whenever we used to get a primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, and, and the X-ray of the loss of lamina dura is called and the X-ray of the bone, or the mandible. You can do a pelvis X-ray. You can see a bit of very thin, thin bone is seen, and some osteitis fibrosa cystica, it can be seen. This is like this, osteitis fibrosa cystica, but this is a different patient, don't forget it. And you can do an, um, a scan, so this is a technician, um, and tetrophosphate scan, which showed a definite uh, big parathyroid adenoma, confirming diagnosis to this person. And this is what one of the Depox um, uh, picture, which nicely picked up a mediastinal parathyroid adenoma. Very nice. This patient presented acute pancreatitis is reported. There are case reports on, on ectopic, um, ectopic parathyroid. Now, what would you do with our person now? This lady, very high calcium, 
we have traffic teaching, we know PTH, very high calcium. I told primary hyperparathyroidism is like to diagnose 16 calcium. We need to do a PTH to diagnose whether there is a PTH dependent or PTH independent hypercalcemia. The PTH came at 6.7. So clearly disproportionately low or a high calcium level suppress the PTH, parathyroid gland, normal homeostasis. So this is, we are dealing with the PTH independent hypercalcemia. And by definition, 16 means severe hypercalcemia. What next? I told patient has bone disorder and we need to think of malignancy or she have it. We have done a myeloma screen. Skeletal survey was normal. Bench juice protein was negative. Serum electrophoresis was actually normal. This is a serum electrophoresis on the right side from a patient with an M band, myeloma band. And the left side is our patients who showed a normal protein electrophoresis. And a, a classic person's, uh, another patient, remember, a multiple myeloma X-ray should show this. Our person X-ray was completely normal. So other malignancies, hematological malignancies, solid tumors, PTH-related peptide, osteolysis, whatever reason it can be. Uh, prognosis is actually quite a bit bad because by the time calcium goes, but we have done investigation, multiple myeloma ruled out, chest X-ray ESR was normal, CBC was normal, ultrasound, bone, ultrasound abdomen was normal, actually a bone marrow was done, and that was normal. Uh, CA-125 was normal, pap smear was negative, even if it's say 71 years, we thought that let us do a good uh, cancer screening. So more or less in our clinical practice, no malignant associated hypercalcemia. So top two common causes we ruled out, primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy associated hypercalcemia. Now comes the real cause we need to pick up. Thyrotoxicosis, Addison's disease, the normal. Thyroid function and cortisol is normal. ACE level, angiotensin converting enzyme was normal. Vitamin D, actually vitamin D was not, not the A. Vitamin D was normal and milk alcohol syndrome is unlikely because serum bicarbonate was only 24. Now, where do we, where are we now with our patient? So this is day one we started seeing. Calcium was very high, phosphate was around 2.2. So we have given uh, diuresis, lasix for around three, four days, then omit drone it for five days. And we can see that slowly, Every day, the calcium is coming down. So something happened after six, seven days. The calcium level is maintained nicely without doing anything till I knew the patient around six months after discharge. So what happened? What is the puzzle? Pamidrone did work. Maintained the calcium level in the normal range, but given only one course, five days. So this was the diagnosis, hypercalcemia related to immobility. is known, but it is error of the cause. And purposefully in our rare classification table of the rare causes, I didn't mention that. Mainly happens in young people. And it's, it's good to know a lot of people with a spinal injury because they are prolonged immobilization. Spinal fracture. This is what happened. This our patient also had a fracture and then person uh, was bed rest for a long time, 30 days in another different city, 40 days in Manipal hospital. So basically patient was immobile for more than two months. And maximum chance happened actually up to four months in the literature. But obviously it has to be a retrospective diagnosis. We have ruled out all other causes and we found that after mobilization started, things improved. Mechanism, increased bone resorption. Treatment, biphosphonate, we have given calcitonin we didn't have to give um, or only biphosphonate. And uh, prognosis is usually good, provided we recognize early and do this. So that's my take-home point, few take-home points. Appropriate collection and assay for sample for PTH and calcium is necessary. We need to document sustained hypercalcemia. I learned this word from Deepak's lecture. At least two samples we need to do just to see that we are doing a real hypercalcemia rather than uh, spurious hypercalcemia. We need to find out whether PTH independent and PTH dependent because that's the commonest cause, easily diagnosed. Treatment of hypercalcemia depends on severity and depends on symptoms also, and obviously the etiology. Do not forget that hypercalcemia can be there without symptom, which we call asymptomatic hypercalcemia. And this is because more common because of package. 
servicing going on. Everywhere you go, every lab you go, they prefer package and people just like it. 99 test in 2000 rupees and who will not like it? And this is being recognized now that we are seeing an asymptomatic hypercalcemia, we have milder hyperparathyroidism cases, but they are not to be neglected. If you neglect it, they can go to hypercalcemia, clinical hypercalcemia symptom, but particular attention of these cases should be done, whether the kidney function is good, whether there is nephrolithiasis is good, whether there is a bone density is not uh, decreased. And in that case, some treatment is needed. Otherwise, up to 12, we keep on waiting. So one lesson, keep walking. I told keep walking. I didn't tell to follow this gentleman. That's up to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Harmon India team. Thank you.